yeah, it was just like me trying to tell myself a story about some of the stuff that maybe I've been doing. And so I've taken this, I don't know, this position about this idea of space. Hey, what's going on? My name's Elliot, and this is season two of Studio Practice. <laughs> If you've been watching my channel, you're probably aware that I haven't made a new YouTube video in about a year, almost exactly a year. The reasons are fairly complex and I'll get into those at some later point. But today we have, as a way of kicking off season two, we have a discussion with the graphic designer, fine artist, educator and musician, Wesley Taylor. Wes is a friend of mine and um, is uh, an amazing entrepreneur, artist and designer. He spent numerous years in the Detroit hip hop community scene building as a member of Athletics Mike League. He's a co-founder of Emergence Media. He's a co-founder of The Talking Dolls and a lead artist in Complex Movements Collective. Wes holds a MFA from the 2D department at Cranbrook Academy of Art. And he is, uh, as I mentioned, he's a graphic designer and an educator. I think one of the things that's most compelling and the thing that will come across pretty clearly in this discussion is the far ranging nature of his, of his endeavors, the fact that he's an entrepreneur and that he's really interested in activism, community building and the way that he collaborates with others. So I think that the model that Wes has, has uh, laid out is super compelling. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Because space is something that really, um, really intrigues me, I think. And not outer space and like space on the planet. And we'll, we'll maybe some of these slides will make um, some things make some sense. Um, you want to share your screen? Yeah, I'm gonna do that right now. I gotta give you. I gotta give you permission. Hang on. Okay, a second. cool. Just one second. Uh, make host. Why should I make I make you co-host? All right. So you should see on your screen a the capacity. Okay. Cool. Since the beginning of it, yeah. And I'm, like I said, I'm gonna try to keep pace and zoom through stuff, and then just cut me off at like 20 minutes, and then we can talk about whatever is relevant at that point in time. No problem, man. And. Man, I'm always so slow on the draw on Zoom and I use it all the time. You sharing yet? Um sharing right now. Cool. All right. So this like I said, this is actually like some really just brand new stuff. Um not brand new work, but just like a brand new approach, right? So I'm I'm gonna start off with uh a place you guys might know really well. These are the stairs of the annex uh, 10, years, 10, 10 years ago, basically. Um, so that's Young Wes. Uh, I'm coming out of a photo shoot with uh, the master Elliot Earls. Um, and so this is <laughs> what Elliot dressed me in. Um, I don't dress like this every day. So uh, just putting that out there. So some more, some more like Cranbrook shots. That's the annex, the old print room. Um, print table, I'm printing with one of my um, colleagues, classmates, uh, Michael Boswell. And then in the bottom corner, like some more of my colleagues, Ellie Kim, Ralph Medina. And these are some of the shows and things that we were putting on like a lot of print and poster shows. Um, and, and the top image was we were putting together some posters for some events I was curating at, at South by Southwest that year. Um, so some work. You know, it's grainy and gritty, 2010, futuristic, it's here. Um, this is some of the work that I was thinking about at Cranbrook. Um, going out, a lot of it was had to do with going out into Detroit, uh, making 
wheat paste murals, things like that. Um, and me really thinking about and really contemplating the future um, from the stance of like 2009, 2010 and thinking about the promise of the future at, at Cranbrook. While I was working on some other things outside collaboratively and collectively, which one major part of my practice is super almost exclusively collaborative and, and collective with a number of, of different groups. Um, so yeah, this is some stuff I just found in my mother's basement uh, a while back. And so that was Cranbrook, but this is kind of where like I come out of um, influence wise. These are the things that kind of mold me as, as an artist, as a creative person. Um, and, and what was really crucial for me was this time in the 90s, like late 80s, but basic, very early 90s, mid 90s, um, music, hip hop, but we can also see a couple books in there. Bomb the Suburbs was really important to me. Um, Elegant Universe, just thinking about like complexity, which comes up later. Um, and, you know, just a, just a collage of, of, of just things that impacted my brain, right? Moving into that, was me being from Detroit. And so these are the thing, these are the people and these are some of the movements that I was a part of uh, during that time. And so if anybody's familiar with underground music, hip hop, um, and in specific to Midwest and in Detroit, uh, a lot of these people like I know and have dealt with or engaged with. And, and so Jay Dilla, Slum Village, really important. Um, Esham, super important. Um, D12, I was, you know, moving around same circles as like Eminem. Um, some more contemporary people, uh, Danny Brown, Dej Loaf, Big Sean. Uh, even what was relevant at that time was, you know, Juggalos. Um, like they weren't ironic at that time. Um, but also they were like, they were serious. They were part of the scene, but also techno. And what I think was really important that I think people may, um, um, you know, take for granted is I have these big images of dancing and da these are all dancing to techno, right? Techno was like actually our party music. There was nothing ironic about techno either. Um, so I think this was really important. Um, and then like, I have, if anybody's familiar with Ghostly International, Ghostly, um, the prior to Ghostly, um, this goes into my next image of the things that I was doing at that time. So this is my crew, Athletic Mike League. Um, and prior to like some of these things being established, like, especially like Ghostly, like they funded our first record. So this is like my hip hop crew. Um, and we started in high school back in the, yeah, early 90s. Um, and so the years of like being part of the Detroit hip hop scene and then us making music from kind of where we were positioned in Ann Arbor, Michigan, gave us like this different perspective of creating a brand new scene. Um, and then one that was in relationship to a, a scene that was really strong and then strengthening those things. And over the years, and just showing some images of like some of the collective members, 14KT, um, who at that image won a like won the uh, Red Bull beat battle. Um, my homie Mayor Hawthorne, and he has a group named Tuxedo. Um, and so he was our DJ. If you go in the bottom right corner, that was us in high school or maybe right after high school. You know, as a crew, as a collective. My homie uh, Jamal Buffert. Um, and his group um, Black Opera right now. And so we'll come, we'll maybe swing back to now and like how music worked. But also what was important was at Cranbrook, I did almost zero dealing with music. I didn't do anything related to my hip hop side while I was at Cranbrook. Um, I kind of like put that in a corner as I was trying to figure out some other stuff. So in this slideshow, this, like I said before, uh, space, music, prints, um, space inside of space, um, immersion in, within space, moving through space and moving spaces, moving smaller spaces through other spaces, 
um, transforming spaces, studios and galleries, um, speculative space, politics of space, and um, you know, no space at all as of right now. And then like sharing of space and thinking about like how cooperatives and collectors work when people are trying to get together, like making work. So another pic picture of Cranbrook, this is more recently at an event called Space um, a couple years ago where I was invited to um, have these, I think, informal conversations where, you know, they built this structure and it was a way to like, I think, be subversive and, and generate conversations that might not have been like completely, um, I don't know, um, set off by the academy. So it was more of a grassroots type of thing. Um, so the, I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time. If, if you guys have, I shared this link and you know, hopefully you guys have checked some of this stuff out. Um, I just wanted to like bring this up as an important thing because prior to coming to Cranbrook, I wasn't that versed in design history and design discourse. And I think I'll give Elliot some credit around thinking about like Design Justice Network, which I think is um, is really important and is growing as a thing. But um, seeing Elliot as a um, the counter to design discourse and somebody who would stand their ground and being like, I always felt like one thing that really like rubbed off really, you know. Um, was a great impression was um, design not doing everything that it could be or should be doing. Um, and, and design being so attached to the past that it can't become new things. And so a lot of that was come seeing like Elliot, you know, tussle with, you know, other design juggernauts and, and, and seeing those things play out in, in public space. And it really started to make form um, my ideas about design and, and thinking about like modernism and, and things like that, that was, was really important. So, and then, you know, these are some publications we made. Um, okay, so the other important thing is innovation, right? So in thinking about moving through space and some, things that have allowed like Design Justice Network has allowed me to move around. Um, I just wanna show you guys a picture. So I don't know if you guys understand what's happening here. So in Italy, there's this um, tower and it's the Tower of Pisa in the, in the city called Pisa. So if you can see what's happening right now, um, the tower is leaning, right? So I take this photo of me holding it up, right? Like, and, and, and so this is like some of the innovative things and I'm thinking about in my practice is even thinking about on the street, right? So, oh, my bad. So it's done and over done. So that's a joke, joke one out of the way. All right, um, but speaking of Italy, this is another photo of, you know, uh, E-dub as I call him. Uh, and, and so this is in Milan during his, uh, during his show at, um, what was it design? Um, was it the it was at the Milan Triennale? Triennale? Yeah, the Milan Triennale. So I was able to travel with him, and and you know this was also really informative, um, with another one of my colleagues, um, um, Nicole Killian, who, which I failed to mention. I'm speaking to you guys from Richmond, Virginia, where I teach at uh, Virginia Commonwealth, um, and there's like a big enclave of like Cranbrook students here. But um, seeing this idea of design being immersive, immersive and spatial was also really transformative for me in my trajectory. And, and going back and digging up this photo, I really actually recall like, yes, this, I could see different potentials of design and thinking about publications as walls and space and, and, and things like that, um, and sculpture and video. So, Space inside of space. This, the photo on top is a photo inside my studio, Talking Dolls, which is in Detroit. Uh, I've been running that studio almost since I got out of Cranbrook. Um, and what's maybe difficult to see is these are two pods set up. 
And these pods are really important because I work with my homie, Aaron Jones, who is also a Cranbrook graduate from architecture. And we've been building these spaces that go inside of spaces. So um, on the left is the complex movement pod. On the right is the techno yurt. And you can see some of that just through the image. Um, but this is the complex movement space, right? And so I think collapsing what I was seeing, what Elliot was doing into like projection, animation, immersion, and, and direct audience um, interaction. And so with my collective complex movements, you know, hopefully you've seen the video so we can talk about that later. I won't go into that deeply, but this is space inside of space, right? Where I'm trying to figure, trying to sort out um, as a designer. Also thinking about the transformation of space. So this is my gallery in, um, in LA, big models with my homie, uh, Aaron Jones. So we run this gallery in LA, which we've just closed down due to like COVID and things like that. But also with another Cranbrook alum, Kim Kunis, who also runs the space. She's not a partner with us in the gallery, but this is some of the work. So that's Kim. That's the guy, uh, Satoru Nihai, right? One of my also close colleagues at Cranbrook. So as we can see, we're this continuity of like Cranbrook connection stays with me over the, this past decade. And so this was a show that we curated for Satoru, brought him out to LA. Um, and I think this was our first, first ever show and it was a, it was a opening or a book launch for one of his typography books, which was a dope event. This is just once again, think about gallery space. So this is our current exhibition of um, Lauren Gibbons, Laura Gibbons, recent grad from photo at Cranbrook at my space at Talking Dolls, which I think is still up, but is already closed. Um, but still think about gallery space and, and providing, um, I don't know, access resources for people to like launch careers or to be able to work things out. Um, and, and so once again, just this idea of being under construction. So this is Talking Dolls a few years ago, um, right after, I think this is right after I purchased the building and we were getting it together to do the complex movements where the dandelions performance. And so we did a whole lot of renovation there. Um, this is kind of how it operates now. We have a print shop, workspace. Um, and once again, it's like under construction again. Um, this is my space in Virginia right now where I'm building out studio gallery space in, in my backyard um, from my home in Richmond, um, which it is literally just in pro process. So. Some stuff in Detroit, thinking about like transfer, trans, I don't know, just space translation and modifying space that's not mine um, on exteriors. Um, this is politics of space. And so this was a installation I did a couple years ago for the Sidewalk Festival in Detroit. And this was an extension of some of the work I'm doing with complex movements. This was a collective work with a lot of a lot of the um, people involved in the abolitionist movement in Detroit, um, working through um, one trying to stop the jail in the justice complex downtown Detroit, which is being currently built. But this is like a major issue that I'm thinking about is like abolition and and um, dismantling of police and like all of that. Um, and so these are just images of like this pop-up space where people had to navigate through through like these banners. And it you know, it was interesting and it relates with what I was just speaking about. Um, the building of jails, the building of things, development, and like how all of these things come together, which I might talk about later, which this is a work also related to that. It's a, it's a piece called um, Kites on Kites, which is in relationship with one of our um, collaborators, Suwatu Salamara. And I put it in the chat if you ever want to look up her story. Um, but this was work dealing with like women's rights and mother's rights within prison. Long story short, um, 
Suwatu was in prison a couple years ago um, for a mandatory gun charge that was licensed and unarmed. Um, and this is while she was pregnant. So she gave birth while in prison. And a lot of these things um, we were dealing with because there's a lot of inhumane treatment. So when she gave birth, it's mandatory that you are shackled, hands and feet. Um, it is also mandatory that um, a guard is present. You cannot have family present. Once the child is born, you spend maybe a couple hours with the child and then the child is taken away from you. So it's like all these things. And so this is like the beginning of thinking about jails, the um, prison industrial complex, but also like these messages, kites, if you know anything about sending a message in prison, they're called kites. Um, and, and so these were really important to Sawatu at that time. So moving through space. Um, how am I doing with time, Elliot? You're good. You're at, you're at 17, but keep going, man. Just okay, okay, okay. So just we'll just try hey, we have, to uh, we run through this really quick. So moving through space, this was a, uh, a trip through the continent of Africa that I took a couple years ago with my homie, Michael Demps, who's one of my best friends. Um, and then one of my really close colleagues and friends, um, Nancy um, Mutiti. And so we, we took this trip and we had a lot of planned exchanges and performances that we worked with people in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, and in um, Addis Ababa. And so um, just going through some of these images, this was kind of like the prep. I was just making like some images. Me and my Mike's, me and my homie Mike's collective is called All Faux Everythings. Um, we make music, publications, and things like that. This is in Ethiopia. Um, I was just like really taken by all these things going on, thinking about space, language, um, and the relationships of like space when you don't have like zoning laws, like how we understand and how things can like mash together. Um, it was really dope. Other people's spaces in these places. Once again, this is still in Ethiopia with these gallery spaces, like black run gallery spaces, which is really interesting. You know, just dope scenery. This is a motif that really struck me, the Lucy remains, which these aren't the actual remains, but these, this motif is starting to show up in my work um, as, as, as a thing. So, so on that, this was an, a performance that we did with a collective called the Monkey Nuts in, in Harare um, at a place called Shea Zandi. Uh, and, and so doing a lot of DJ, this is space in also in Zimbabwe um, by, um, uh, not Ed Maya, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but this is like compound art studio space where there's, um, you know, they're raising livestock, they have a store and they're providing space and residency space in different places around the city of Harare. Um, gallery space in Ethiopia. This is um, the studio space of Desta, who just recently passed in Ethiopia. That's Nancy over there. This is an exchange in South Africa where we're just doing like collective music making um, with different artists and the exchanges and sharing of like gear and like streetwear that we were making on the fly while we were there. And like a lot of this was like, was the story of the trip. Um, in these images, uh, space, youth run space, like downtown Johannesburg, which I was really taken by, um, where these kids were like late teens, early twenties. And they were, I had, I had this gallery space in downtown um, Johannesburg. This is Ethiopia again. Um, this is me and Mike, all for collective, all for everything's collective, some photos. Also in the background is the work of the guy, Chris Shank, um, but also taking pictures taken by Claire Gatto, uh, who shares space in, and I'm, I mentioned Cranbrook people, right? So like still, we're talking about two years ago, Cranbrook is still part of the continuum um, as, as I move through and do things. So this is coming back the picture in the top right is just a recent um, retreat I took with my homies, uh, my crew, Athletic Mike League in LA. I just got back about a week ago, right? We're risking it. We're risking it all, like, to make stuff. Um, and, and it's paid off. Like, nobody is, like, testing positive. 
for COVID. So we decided to do it, like make joints. Um, the middle picture was a retreat that we took in um, Virginia at my home here. Um, and this was, I think everybody left March 12th and we had a week long retreat. So that's the day before like the official lockdown of COVID. Um, and, and so this was a result. So I don't know, I don't know if I put this in the link um, for, for share this album, but this is the first volume from these retreats that we're making um, doing. So these are just random prints. This print was something that I displayed at Cranbrook for critique at some point. And then like, I'm building layers on top of it. So it's like the color part of it was something I put there. And then like maybe a year and a half ago, I decided to like dig it back up and like make new stuff. This is the drip. Um, drip is also one of my favorite motifs, but drip has also like been a motif before. Like, I feel like it was like slang. So I, this was a show. Um, I don't know, I probably made these five years ago. And once again, the continuity is, I was assisted by Kat Burdine, a graduate of print media, um, who's also working in the studio. This is more recent work, which I feel like is ironic because it looks like 90s graphics, um, but I'm, I'm into it. And, and this is where that, that, um, that Lucy um, motif starts to show back up of like laying out of bodies. Um, and also like the motif of which I haven't shared, but um, um, the Shroud of Turin. And both of those things are like really starting to like form in my print work together. This was a recent album cover I did with, for my homie, really close collaborator, Sterling Tolls. But this is an album that um, he created with um, Boldy James. And if anybody knows about like hip hop going on right now, Griselda Records, um, Boldy is the homie. And, and so this was a really like experimental album for somebody that is like doing things um, more on a national scale, but Boldy's one of my favorite artists. So like, this was an honor to like, to like make this, make this work. Um, this is like still moving through space. And I think where I'm coming from as into this point now. So this is work with my collective complex movement. We're in Santa Fe at the Santa Fe Institute. Santa Fe Institute is known for its um, work in complexity science, also its history with the Manhattan Project. Um, Manhattan Project. Um, but this is us workshopping with a bunch of like physicists, um, med students and, and people like that who are really into the idea of how they can bring just a justice lens to their practice within like physics and, and sciences and things like that. Um, some more drip just thrown in there. Space inside of space, random stuff. Uh, this was like the shot from France with the uh, new museum and their, uh, what was a city, um, some city. Um, this was in Ohio State. So this was like, part of the story was like, we had all these residencies planned at as a collective complex movements before COVID hit. And so on the right, we see the guy, Ann Hamilton, right? Um, and, you know, it was kind of mixing it up with us there, but also like virtual space, like we were like working through VR and, and immersive things. There we were working with dancers and some of the work we were going through. And now it's this, right? This is all my life is. Um, that's with my family, that's with my collective, right? That's with the homies, like making, for making music. And, you know, that's where, that's where I'll end us in, you know, flipping through slides like really fast. Great. Um, can you, uh, let's see if I, if I can go back to gallery view and then uh, I think we can do speaker view. All right, so my students have obviously uh, uh, done some research on you and have, have some questions. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to them. Don't be shy. Hi Wes, um, something I was struck by with your um, work is just how much of it is um, tied to collaboration. 
And um, something I'm curious about is how you identify, you know, who you want to collaborate with. I know you mentioned you work with a lot of Cranbrook uh, graduates, but um, you seem to work with a lot of people. So, you know, how do you know um, a good person to collaborate with and how do you like also get them to want to collaborate with you too? And I think that's something that I struggle with. Um, Cause there's plenty of people I'd love to collaborate with, but I don't know if they always want to collaborate with me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's partially like, Jay, Jay, were you saying something? No, I was just saying, how do you manage also like to add on to that question? How do you manage so many collaborations at once? Yeah. I mean, like managing is a relative term, right? Let's, let's, let's assume that that may or may not be happening <laughs> um, effectively. Right. But uh, it's also just how I, I, I move and it's like hard for me not to operate in that in that realm. So I operate collaboratively. I don't know if I manage well all the time and like still I'm trying to figure out like how to like pull some of it back. Because um, like another part of that is like my teaching practice, which is a whole nother thing that I didn't even speak about. And like at this point, like something's got to go. And recently it's like if I'm teaching on Zoom all the time, teaching might have to go. Um, but you know, that's, that's a side note, but, um, how to, and, and thinking about it, I think without being like super generic, part of it is training. So I've been training to work collaboratively ever since I was in high school, like making music. And, and, and so like a lot of my major lessons learned happened very early in like me like molding my career but what i found was really important is like relationship building like not leading with a project you lead with like socializing as a thing you lead with like genuine interest in that person not what they could potentially offer and do um and then i think like long-term relationship building and collaboration means like you're invested in that person being better um like over the long run right and 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 so there i think there are always like these pie in the sky people that we revere and it's like i would love to work with that person and you're right next to somebody that is not pie in the sky and is like still trying to figure things out but i think the thing that you might have to recognize with the people like closest to you or lateral to you is at one point in time in the future there's a good chance they will be the pie in the sky version for somebody else so it's like how much do you invest in that person so that they can be that person um and th these things become reciprocal um and, and so i don't you know I, I think about it a lot you know and i might have other thoughts around it but i think that's those are some like really basic aspects to like collaborate how do you um take on like leadership roles within your collaborative groups or do you see it as more as like a, a synthesis between the people that you're working with? Yeah, I think, I think about it as more of a, as, as a synthesis, um, leadership role. I mean, I have, I have ideas about leadership, um, especially coming out of like complex movements. And, and so what I didn't present was, during the time I was in at Cranbrook, I was actually developing a lot of this stuff. So I was talking about like some of this work with complexity science and, and things like that. Um, at that time, um, we were developing what I call like an iconographic system, what we call the emblems. And these emblems were metaphors from complex science that kind of like related to movement building. And these ideas that we were working through, through complexity science, through um, quantum physics, through ideas in biology, were being fed to us by some of our mentors. So um, one person that mentored us and like really was important to what we were doing was um, Grace Lee Boggs. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Grace's work as a, as a um, as an activist, but Grace was one of our direct mentors and inspired our work. And so a lot of the work that we made was a translation of her philosophy and like movement building. 
Um, and, and so she was thinking about complex science as a metaphor for a new generation of change making just on the planet. And so I bring all that up because we came down to like six metaphors. One of the metaphors was um, the starling or the, the murmuration or bird flocks. And, and, and so the murmuration as a metaphor was also this, this thing being theorized by other movement leaders, um, in particular, um, Charity Hicks, who was a major eco um, advocate and, and activist who lost her life in New York uh, appealing to the U, like the UN Council about the water rights issues in Detroit, um, but I'm saying all that to say is like this idea of like leaderlessness and leaderfulness is the way that I think about and I, I internalize leadership. And so when I have when I collaborate with people, a lot of times we understand things through these emblems um, and understanding that like. Leadership is not a thing to, to achieve unless like everybody feels like a leader and nobody feels like they need to lead at the same time. And I can um, provide like the images like from the, the emblems because I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown, but that work that we were doing was the research for that book. So the emblems actually show up in that book, but Adrian was also on that journey with us at that time while I was in Cranbrook and doing a lot of this research. And so Beware the Dandelions became the performative piece and then Emergent Strategy actually was just the book version of, Emergent, of Beware the Dandelions in a lot of ways. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. All right. So um, it seems like a portion of your work really like dives into the realm of sci-fi in um, talking about like change in systems, etc. Um, how how do you feel like that mechanism works for you, and how did you come to a place where you found sci-fi as kind of a, a realm for communicating? Yeah, I mean, you know, this was not a word. This was not a phrase while I was at Cranbrook, and I'm not saying it didn't exist. But this didn't exist in um, the pop, like the art world as a whole, like ten years ago, right? Which might be taken for granted now, but like phrases like Afrofuturism were not in the public sphere whatsoever, right? They had already been invented. They had already been things, right? They go back to like times of like Sun Ra, and then they go back to times of like Octavia Butler, like writing about these things. But when you talk about like the arts and Afrofuturism and a curator saying, I want to make a work or a project about Afrofuturism it was not really a thing. Um, I will give credit to some early people. I think we're thinking about it really early, um, especially like in Detroit. Um, um, what, uh, what am I blanking? Um, Ingrid. Um, um, What's Ingrid's last? Why am I blanking on her last name? Um, Ingrid Lafleur. Lafleur, yes. So Ingrid early on was really on this. So I remember maybe it was like nine years ago she was curating this Afrofuturist show in South Africa and like included us in it, right? But she she was really on it. But getting back to it, like I actually don't identify as an Afrofuturist. I don't shun it but that's not really that's not really the mode or modality that i feel like i'm working in i borrow from it i know that it's there i think it's dope but also there are, there are other aspects where um i take a lot of cues from octavia butler um and 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 in in her work which you know the lineage is okay if you're taking cues from octavia butler you're an afrofuturist which is like cool, but like still, I'm still not trying to couch my work in that conversation so much. I think um, this other word that I think goes around Detroit that really struck me more than Afrofuturism is just like visionary um, 
anything like visionary, like organizing, visionary, um, I don't know, ways of working and being that um, I feel like I'm working, that's, that's kind of the realm that I'm working in. So science fiction becomes really important, but like I'll go into deep dives, science fiction, like, you know, even reading, you know, um, all kinds of sci-fi authors um, from Asimov to Philip K. Dick to um, like, I don't know, Ursula Le Guin, you know, all of these people. But um, sci I mean, I feel like sci-fi is just really important, just is, is a super important tool, right? And I can go on for days about like it as a tool, but I think what really struck me about science fiction where I started to see it at play in, in the real world um, and I realized like we're always living in people's sci-fi worlds and in, in some way or another and being run by people's science fiction's notion of like the world. And one way that one place that I really see it is like in urban development and architecture. And when you think about those practices as being completely mediated through fiction until a major shift happens at an actual place, then I'm like, these people are like using science fiction all the time. They're making renderings, right? They're making um, storyboards of like how a place will be programmed, not much different than a comic book, really, when you start to think about like how the media is at play. And then all of a sudden, and when I say all of a sudden, I mean like 10 years, 15 years later, you realize Brooklyn is a totally different place. And that was based on the science fiction of urban designers and architects. Hi, um, so space and city seem to be really important to you and you, you repeatedly brought up Detroit and via LinkedIn, I found out that you've been at VCU since 2000, or 2016, is that correct? Mm -hmm. so I was walking, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to um, Richmond and how living there has influenced your work and also how living there has um, kind of influenced your work that you're still doing in Detroit as well. Yeah, yeah, good question. Do you, do you have any relationship with Richmond or familiarity with it? Um, not much. Very, very minimal. Nicole Killian did come last year and kind of talked a little bit about Richmond in the city um, there, but I would not say that I know a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, um, Richmond is a really interesting place where, like, where I'm located, like, right now is, like, okay, let me, I'm trying to think about, like, this as, like, a story. So, Detroit in like southeastern Michigan is like where I grew up, right? And it's like most of my context. But historically and like ancestrally and like line, like I have very little connection to Detroit. Like I have no cousins or anything like that. It's just like my immediate family moved there. And like I would have like maybe third or fourth cousins that lived around, but whatever. And then being in Virginia where I'm actually like 12 miles away from the ancestral lands of my paternal grandmother, um, which is really, which is really interesting. Um, and so I, like, I spend a lot of time in Virginia, not necessarily, my family's not necessarily located in Richmond, but Richmond is, is, is an interesting place in that um, it's a majority black city, um, which, you know, being in between Detroit and Richmond is definitely like part of like the conversations that I'm like always trying to have. Um, you know, I'm sure people are familiar with like the monuments and the history of it being, you know, the capital of the Confederacy. And what I find really interesting about that is Richmond, unlike Detroit, which Detroit is like, uh, in some ways you can contextualize it as an African nation. Um, but Richmond, because of its history, cannot skirt this idea of racism. Like you can't move around racist histories, ra like oppressive histories in any way. Where Detroit being positioned in the North, you can get around it really easily 
through conversation, like in any type of conversation, there's culpable, there's deniability all the way around when you're talking about race in, in Northern cities and especially in Detroit, which is, I find is really weird in a place that is 80% black. Um, and so like, I always found that stifling and I always found that really like um, disingenuous when trying to make work and trying to like build an art community and you can't like people will not have that conversation with you in a meaningful way where in richmond everything all like all bets are off until that like something is worked through or understood i feel and like i'm i'm generalizing right and romanticizing and essentializing but i'm saying i find these in general to be true no, that makes a lot of sense. I lived in Baltimore for five years and I definitely, just from how you're describing Richmond, definitely feel that Baltimore has a much, much more similarities in that, in that tone um, than I found in this part of Michigan. And I'm from Michigan too. So that's also kind of an interesting shift. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. What is your like pedagogical approach? Like, what do you think is like the most important thing to your students and your teaching practice? To just sort of switch into that. Yeah, man. Uh, pedagogical approach. I feel like I'm still developing it, and I'm I'm still thinking about like experimenting with what I think is important in a classroom, and and what is not. Especially when I'm thinking about like, for instance, undergrads, right? There's like this pressure, and I think there's always this tension. And like Elliot, you might like see this tension too, all like all the time that I'm bring that I'm about to bring up. And if anybody had experience within education, may maybe see this. And I don't think this is like the overwhelming thing, and this is not the thing that like dominates like my thoughts and teaching. But the tension between um students not knowing what they don't know and like exposure to like those things and like just being able to, but also like this weight or pressure, which I think 10 years ago, um, there like clout wasn't a word, but we, you know, we threw the word around like, Oh, like, like if you're trying to get heavy in like the blog game, right. And you're trying to like circulate through that. Um, and I think that's been replaced by clout just in general. Right. And, and people chasing clout through these mediums and then being like, all right, one, I don't know. I don't know if you actually understand how clout is easy, how easy it is to gain. Um, and there are way better lessons that we could be like talking about like right now. Um, but it's just like clout is way easier to get now than it was to like get blogs. Like if you want to pop on Instagram, like all you need is like a thousand dollars, like put that to ads in like Facebook, put it on ads on Instagram, put it on ads on like Twitter and then watch your shit flourish. Like it's not, it's, there's like, there's no such thing as organic growth in that way. Like these things are designed in a way where you have to pay to get that clout or to get these followers or platforms. Don't like, and then after that, like just ask your parents for a loan and like for, for some likes and some followers, you'll get a blue check like in a year's time if like you just follow some YouTube tutorials on how to get followers on Instagram, right? But I, so it's like, we can have like that conversation, which I also start to, starting to think is really interesting because I'm starting to recognize that media is being centered on these places, right? So I can be like, I can deny that, I can act like it doesn't exist. And I understand that in a few years time, like there's a high likelihood that, um, influencing or influencer classes or programs will be part of schools like curriculum potentially right so i'm also like predicting that as a moment and trying to figure out like this tension between those those two things um and being like you know my pedagogy like i'm still trying to understand my pedagogy in this shift to like COVID times and social distancing is like, for what? Like, what are we doing any of this for? And what are we teaching? Like, what, what do people actually want if like galleries are not a thing that people can go and engage with like they did in the past? 
Um, and so it's like this, there's, there's, there's this big question of like for what and why any of this is happening right now that I'm trying to like sort out in my brain, but also like test out in, in classrooms. Um, and it's just like, you know, there was a status quo. It's like, how many people are taking advantage of like this turning on top of his head to like shift the status quo to like not being, and I'm saying all that to say is like from like a faculty sense it's one thing, but then like also like trying to get my students to understand like my generation was not shit. We didn't change anything. And it's like, you guys could actually change some shit um, especially at this moment where this moment was never laid out for me on a platter throughout my, throughout my youth. And so it's like, how do you turn that into pedagogy to be like, look, you can tell me, you can start dictating terms on your education, on the way you want art to be, on how you want things to happen. And, and so, yeah, I, th I think that's like my most recent thing that I'm thinking about as like pedagogy, which if you go back, I think design justice is also like pedagogy and then like science fiction is also being a major chunk of like my pedagogical um, like concerns. Can I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was wondering if I could ask another question. Yeah. Um, you've given like a lot of references and like names of people. I feel like you're really referential when you're talk when you talk. Um, this might be a hard question, but what are like three to five of like the primary texts or primary people or thinkers that you find have influenced your practice or that you find yourself going back to a lot um, in your work? Yeah, I mean, I think that's easy and hard at the same time, because I think that, that can spiral out of control really, really fast as far as like influences. I know you're asking me to like bracket it. Um, so maybe even groups of people. So my collectives as groups and I can like name them. So like Athletic Mike League, um, my brother Vaughn, uh, KT, Drew, Mayor Hawthorne, Jamal Bufford, um, Trey Allen, uh, Michael Fletcher. Like these, those are all people like as a group, those are very influential since high school. They've been influential and uh, like have inspired me. Um, Moving into my other collective, Complex Movements, um, Ill Weaver, who also goes back to like high school, um, but I think has been really influential on a lot of things artistically and my like worldview. Um, and, and talk about like somebody who was really like indoctrinating me into, in a very good way, into like activism, um, thinking about like identity um, in ways that I didn't understand. Um, as like, you know, if you go back to like, if you can imagine like an 18 year old being influenced heavily by hip hop, right? Where if you're an 18 year old influenced heavily by hip hop, then at that time from the nineties, the music was very much homophobic, misogynistic, um, and, and all these other things, right? And these things had impressions on my brain at that time. And I had to have like other people be like, nah, that's not cool, especially when you start to put that in your music. Um, or like, you know, I identify as this person or, you know, you know, or maybe you need to be around like a whole lot more like trans people to like understand what, you know. And so like those things were major to me for me to like break like major chains of like transphobia, homophobia. Um, misogyny or whatever and so I give a lot of credit to like ill in, in that of like sticking with me um, over a lifetime um, but other people that I think are influential let's talk about like negative influences not, not, not in a bad way but people like I think like against like so and I take inspiration from but like the Elon Musk of the world right so I know just like throwing somebody out like that is just like yeah, okay. But I actually, when we talk about science fiction, and I'm talking about living in people's science fiction's world, fiction world, we are living in Elon Musk's science fiction world, and we're living in his world as put out by George Lucas. 
as put out by other direct, like movie directors and like media that, that have influenced them. So I'm like, all right, so if they're influ influenced by like Luke Skywalker, um, or I was just having this conversation with my class, um, my design activism class last night. And I was like, if your hero is Luke Skywalker, then it only makes sense that the slogan of your company, and I'm talking about Google, is to like do no harm or whatever it is, do no harm, right? That, that, that's like the most lukewarm nod to like making a change in the world, which can be very equivalent to like Luke Skywalker as a metaphor, as a hero, right? Um, so I'm like going back to influences, you know, Audre Lorde, like, um, like, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, Bell Hooks, like, if, if, if Elon Musk was reading some of that, then I don't think we, I would be worried so much about his Mars future than I am right now if they're just reading, like, you know, um, you know, you're being influenced by Terminator and Ayn Rand at the exact same time. Like, I'm not really excited about that, that future. Um, and so, um, so still talking about people, um, uh, I think Jay Dilla, um, major influence, just like aesthetically, sonically, um, man, Mike Banks of Underground Resistance, um going back to like my crew um complex movements um ill sage who is actually here right now doing like work for a show that i'm curating in richmond um carlos garcia and um yg and and yg is also like a major influence of like how i think in this in this thinking about aesthetics um i don't know you know my parents uh uh, I would say like my other collaborators, like Mike Dimps, Aaron Jones. And, and so like, there's like a, a, a huge list of, I, I think people that I bid into and then people that I study just to know like what they're trying to like lay a path for because they have power and influence. I got a question for you that I'm yeah. curious about, you, you know, you, You've really, in a lot of ways, you've been you've been uh, really successful to, in, in, to to get your career to pop, you know. And um, you've been very successful, as is evidenced through your presentation, in your collaborations about leveraging, um, you know, making large scale works and um, being able to get financing for your projects, among other things. And I'm wondering if there's any, any advice or, or, or any, you know, you've been in the game for a little while and you've done a fucking amazing job with that. So like, what are some of the takeaways? What are some of the things that you've learned in that process? And, and maybe to the, to the current grad students, what's, what's some, what's some uh, you know, real advice on that? Too? I mean, um i think first is like writing like making sure like your writing practice like at cranbrook right now like i understand you know you guys are writing reviews and things like that like i remember staying up for 52 hours straight just trying to write a review right and sometimes my reviews would come at 75 percent but I would like still stay up and try my hardest because like that was writing reviews in like the most academic way in the most well thoroughly researched way um, in order to try to get to the point um, I think has helped me write for grants and funding in like immense ways. Um, and, and there I see like a direct correlation between writing a review and a grant proposal. Um, enabled to contextualize, enabled to communicate a thing or a thing that doesn't exist or might exist in the future, but also like just being able to just being able to communicate a work of art and its impact. And so with reviews, it's like things that have already existed, 
but writing grants is like for things that may exist. Um, but, you know, that was really important. And it's like, I think I'm slow and really slow to do things. So it's like, maybe given a week, I could probably write way better reviews. I was always impressed by people that could write a review in two, like in, in, in a day and be done. Like, you know, I was, I was really like excited to see that and to see like a well-crafted review and like knowing somebody actually slept even writing that thing. Um, but not just me writing, but hearing other people's reviews and the way that they craft things. Like, you know, I'm, I'm bringing this back to Cranbrook, but like, I'm, I'm being dead serious. And um, that even goes further back to when like in undergrad where I would take a lot of art history classes and write like art history papers and like really take that serious. Um, but there's a direct correlation towards you skill, you're, you, you're skilling yourself up in your writing and communication, um, not just through clicking a mouse and Photoshop and Illustrator. Like you'll see bigger checks if you're not clicking a mouse and being able to communicate yourself through writing um, in, in, in the art world, like, trust me. Um, and and um, so I think, that, I, think that's, I think that's major. Going back to the original question about um, influences, and I think something we've been able to communicate and I think that's been able to help us more recently is the ref are some of the references that we're working with. So being able to reference like a uh, uh, a Grace Lee Boggs as like a direct mentor, but also being able to reference um, a Gloria House now as a direct mentor, and being able to be like you know the story of our work is translating like elder knowledge into works of into arts of like creative works. And so like, if you can understand what it is, the thing you're doing on a meta level with your work um, and understand the patterns of your own work, um, then I think these things translate really well. Um, and I, you know, for, for me and in fundraising, I don't think we ever chased a trend um, in, trying to do, in trying to do this. We under, tried to understand what we were doing try to communicate that as best as we could and then try to see whoever would come to that. Um, and so I think we were lucky in like striking with, with that in kind of sort of like a real time. Um, but I, I know when we were writing our first grant proposals, we didn't look around to see what was being funded at that time in order to like mold our, our, our grant proposals. So I don't, is, does, does that, is that answer your, partially answer your question, Elliot? Yeah, excellent, excellent. I was taking notes, man. <laughs> but also I think with funding is, is a whole different thing. It's like this, I don't like the word, but it's a real word, uh, but entrepreneurial pursuits um, in like, as like destinations and in between things, right? Um, starting biz like the story is like there's a lot of like activist work um advocacy work or wh however you want to call it within that but also within the the in between those um slides is like serial like me starting businesses and like helping other people start businesses um and so like even in the studio we have a screen printing shop where we share a lot of like resources but part of it is like fine arts part of it is like trying to help people do things and then the other thing is like straight up like printing doing straight up client print jobs um for people and then just like trying to collect checks and then it's that and then trying to mentor other people to like start up their own even if they didn't go to grad school even if they didn't go to undergrad um start like streetwear lines and things like that like that's always happening um so I, I'm thinking about that, but I'm also like thinking about like, I have like real estate strategies um, and, and trying to work those things through, through like rent and like living off of like tenants. Like, so all of these things I'm trying to like sort out and like resource my, um, you know, my practice. And I think you know, that, some things work, some things don't work. Um, I think that's super exciting, man. When we see, when you see the Talking Dolls studio and, and you see what you're doing in, in Richmond with your, 
with your studio and the, and the fact that the entrepreneurial aspects of your work are so present. I don't know. I, I find that to be, to be really super exciting. Um, yeah. And, I mean, and it's fun, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about like, I'm thinking about capitalism for sure. And the other thing is, is like, I don't, because of like all these other things, I don't have time to think about myself as like a gallery presenting artist, right? So one thing that you don't see is like my work on the walls of like, you know, there's, there's not the inclusion in the Whitney Biennial. There have been conversations with the Whitney Biennial uh, in the past, but like, this is not necessarily a priority. So like sometimes these conversations don't go so far. Um, and I'm not saying I'm opposed to it, but it's just like, that's, that's, that's not my trajectory. So I'm always thinking about like outside spaces, alternative spaces, um, you know, and I think um, work, um, work practice space in like Lamert Park by, um, uh, I'm getting old, so like, blank, like my, uh, my name, hold on. Um, it's embarrassing that I can't. Uh, sorry, these things like eat me up if I don't if I don't figure it out. Damn, our computer's working slow. You good? Hey, at the end oh, of this- Mark, Mark Bradford. So sorry, I'm like, I'm just blanking, but like Mark Bradford is like a major person that influences me in a way, that, you know, he's a gallery, he's like he's a gallery presenting artist, but he's always trying to like create and make space for other artists, which I think is, is something that I'm trying to see in, in, see in my practice. Other questions? I had one sort of off of that, of um, the idea of like your relationship with things that you essentially like leave behind or empower to others and how, how that sort of works. And, and a lot of your work, you're collecting stories as well, like what happened to those collections and. You, you know, Lindsay, that's, um, that is like, uh, a major question because that's something like we're trying to like always sort out and figure out and we don't always have the answer to and I think that's like one of the like one of our biggest like hanging chads like right now is like collecting stories and then figuring out like adequate ways to archive them adequate ways to give ex uh, like accessibility to them adequate ways to like give the stories back um which takes just a ton of time and energy to think about these things in really thoughtful ways and then being able to be like, and not just dropping it off, like, all right, we did this um, here. You can have the edited version of it or whatever, which is one way to do it. Um, but archiving um, is really hard to do. Like you have, in, like you have like, like YouTube and things like that, where these things can live. But the question is, is like, what if the stories that you're collecting are very sensitive and not meant for the public, right? And, or meant for curated audiences. And, and, and so that is the question that we're always trying to sort out. And then what is the, the vessel that presents it? Is it just a screen or is it a screen and a space? Or does it like mimic the way that we intended for it to go out there? So you know, part of Beware the Dandelions where we collected stories, um, they, we haven't figured out how to share these back with the communities we, we shared them with, that we've like borrowed them from. Um, and there have been ways like all, like case by case bases where we figured some things out in like very piecemeal way. Um, but it's just like, these stories are actually since like, um, sensitive by um you know 
um, like in like the inward working of like movement building where like some people are in prison, breaking laws in prison and things like that. And so when you see that work, we're inviting just several people to come and see it, like 30 people, right? But to put that on YouTube is not the way to do it. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, if anybody has like, you know, interesting ideas around archiving and presenting like stories in that way, like I'm open to people's research and the, what people do or how they figure that out. Yeah, I mean, I think I think archiving right now is a, a big challenge for pretty much everybody. Um, like I know uh, uh, someone that works for the New York Times and like they're trying to take stories from like the late 90s and make them accessible on the Internet. And like that's pretty difficult for them now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 very curious how you take these like physical experiences and archive them on the Internet for later. It sounds like that's something that you're currently navigating. Um, and yeah that just seems like a huge struggle for a lot of people right now um but i'm curious uh what have attempts have you made uh i guess at, at least in the sort of digital archiving of of your previous shows that's tough and i'm always like being at cranbrook i was like like up until recently in complex movements i was the only one with the mfa right um so I'm, I'm saying that to say um recently like carlos just got his um, MFA from U UCLA, but I'm like, we're making this experiential work. And I realized like the difficulties around like, like art, like documenting and archiving this type of work. And so like, I've just been resigned to be like, look, this stuff never translates where I think people that don't necessarily are not trained in the ways or exposed to like some of the things that I've like, figured out a long time just through like art history and like studying different movements when you're talking about movements that have been like dominated by performance work, right? It always pales in comparison to the experience. But also if you don't like, if people don't like study that, then it's just like, all right, how do we document this? And like, how do we capture it? And I'm just like, man, forget that. Like, just like let it happen and, and do the thing. And like, let's just take some photos. Um, but I think what I'll call it naivete, um, I don't think it's that, but this other like optimism around it, like we're still trying to figure out like, how do you have, like, how do you do a show where there are cameras present and you have like different camera angles and then like, how do you edit that? Um, and I also recognize we're always mad when we see the documented version of our work. Like it never fails to like, you know, and I'm like, I think, people feel like there's like this idealized way to document like performance or like ephemeral work, which I'm just like, uh, I, I don't know. It's like cameras. But the other thing that I'm, I'm we're, we're working through, like these become projects and projects is like a lot of world building and immersive space. Right. And so like, how does that translate to like VR and things like that, which I'm not a huge fan of VR. But I'm, I'm definitely a fan of like the tools of VR and like game tools and like 3D space and like 3D programs and game engines and like all of that. Um, and, and just thinking about, um, you know, how, how do these worlds exist, not just in these physical spaces that we created for them to exist in. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe when we start like LIDAR starts to like record video, then like that'll, that'll be a game changer. Have you heard of Philadelphia Assembled? Are you familiar with that exhibition? Um, maybe, I'm not so sure. It like happened with the, the PMA, the Philadelphia Museum of Fine Art. I want to say like summer of like 2017 was when things like really went off. Um, and it's a really, I was like living in Philly at the time. It's a really weird exhibition kind of project piece that Jana von Heswick um, kind of was like the artist curator of the exhibition um, in, in like kind of consultation with Carlos Basualdo, who's the museum's like senior curator of contemporary art. But 
it was like very community based and there were kind of like physical spaces built, but then a large part of the exhibition were just like programmings around the summer. There's like an archival aspect mm -hmm. of the exhibition too. And they kind of have an interesting website that was built specifically for the project that talks about the network. Um, the website is phlassembled.net. Yeah, I'm on it. I'm on it. Um, which, you know, and it, like the exhibition kind of like read as institutionalizing radicality to me in this interesting way, but I think that what it was trying to do, um, for me, like I always kind of go back to it. So I don't know, it could just be like an interesting thing to look at. Um, it's kind of their network. If you go to that tab, Elliot, it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. but yeah, that was kind of a. A, a strange exhibition, but I'm, I'm I'm definitely gonna I'm definitely gonna dig into that. And then my homie uh, Muti um, Reed, who's an artist based in Philly and and um, uh, New Orleans, is 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 staying at my house right now. So I'm gonna ask them about it too. For, yeah, I lived with one of the designers for this website. Like the summer that they were doing it, it was like very it's interesting to hear about. Yeah. Wes, you mind if I show people the picture of you? I mean, <laughs> you can say no. I mean, go ahead. Okay. Did anyone want to want to throw a question in there while I? There we go. I mean, I can ask another question. Um, do you read Alexis Pauline Gums at all? Nope, but I will. She's just okay. Do you know the Borderline podcast with? Uh, pretense hand pill? No, you know, I'm like, like, I don't, not deep into like podcasts, so I only just take recommendations. Um, I'm not either. This was just recommended to me. Yeah. But I was listening to it this summer, and if I can get your contact info from Elliot, I can send it to you. And it's like really interesting because there was a lot of talking about like remember memory and like ancestry. And so that's kind of like why I was getting at the question of who are influential thinkers? Because um, a large part of that con of that conversation was talking about um, the extreme love of kind of the founders of Black feminism in terms of imagining a future and also doing this work out of love for people who haven't existed yet. Mm -hmm. um, that was just kind of like really interesting that came up when when you were talking as well so yeah that's all I have yeah yeah no I'll, I'll definitely check that out <laughs> that, was that was a fun fun that was, that was that was fun any any last questions for Wes we've held him for about a, uh, an hour and a half so anything Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I mean, I, I, I appreciate being here. Like I have very fond memories of Cranbrook. Um, so I, I definitely, I, I definitely appreciate that place. And I know like, there's like all these transitions and things like that, um, that are going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, this could be a whole nother conversation. I was I, I, like, I'm really interested in like, chopping it up with with Elliot about this but another part I feel like a major part of my, my pedagogy is um and these are conversations that I'm having with like my fellow Cranbrook graduates right reflecting back on Cranbrook in the state of Cranbrook right now but even in teaching in, in students which has been a thing and I'm trying to figure it out but this idea of like at obsolescence, right? How do you teach somebody to plan their own obsolescence individually and like institutionally, right? Um, and then how do you like prepare that? Like, how do you figure that out? And not saying like it's specific to Cranbrook, but I think like even like, how do we like think about the obsolescence of even like arts education? Like when is their job well done? And then like we move on to like new phases or if it's specific to Cranbrook, like when is, when is Cranbrook's job well done already done? 
um, in, in thinking about that. And I, so I'm thinking about that through institutions, but also as like designers, when you're, you know, I resist this notion as a designer, as the designer being like, um, um, solution oriented or, or problem solver. Like that's not, that's not a thing that I actually think about as a designer. I think that's really problematic when you start to identify yourself as a problem solver or being based in solutions. And the reason, and I think it's really problematic because if you're a true problem solver, then you actually plan obsolescence, right? You, the, your need for being around or being there later on is gone because the thing has been solved, which I think designers actually plan, um, plan like this state of unfinished business all the time in order to stay relevant or to keep paychecks going. Um, and, and so like, that's always like this thought, this always this thought of mine of like um, design pedagogy and like where that, where that comes into play. Are you really a problem solver or are you like trying to keep a job? Um, and, and where those things in conflict with each other. Yeah, I'd love to do that. You, you mentioned chopping it up sometime. I think that uh, met a lot of those issues, obviously the nature of, of what, what we do here at Cranbrook in some ways is, is exactly the same and in, in some ways has changed quite radically. And I think that you know, the fact that, that you've spent a lot of time uh, and in your, in your network as well, and with a lot of the people that, that I know and love, um, you know, we, we all, we're all approaching the same problem from, from different perspectives. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to think of it as a, potentially as a future conversation that we have, you know, because, you know, your experience is going to be in some ways extremely similar to mine and to ours. And in other ways, it's going to be radically different. And yeah, you could do nothing but uh, create a really stimulating conversation. Yeah. But no, this is, this is great. I wish this could have been in, in person. Um, John, what's up, man? How's it going, dude? Uh, long time, long time. Glad to I see know you. it's it's been a minute. I was just kind of so soaking it all in and seeing what else you're up to. I was, uh, yeah, I was I was just wondering about your time at Cranbrook too, about just like close out, like what you were working on and how you felt. Like it was one of the things that I was just thinking about, like um, verse collaboration and like this paradox of like deep internal dive I think is the thing that I always face with Cranbrook of like everybody's here we can all work on shit together you know but then there's also this paradox of like but you got to read and you got to like work on this shit and get it done and obviously you've been extremely productive and you've also been extremely social and, and hanging out with people making good connections so sorry to kind of just blast that in at the end but uh, I was just wondering if you could just give like a little tidbit on that before you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, it's just, I like, in, in some ways I don't envy you guys whatsoever. Like going to school during COVID times, I do not, I'm not jealous at all. Um, but at the same time, like you guys will be experts in a very specific thing that I think will be relevant later whether we get on the other side of this COVID thing or whatever I think people will be looking at you to draw from your experience in 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 ways that you might not even expect or can foresee as of right now and I can't even foresee that but I think it's there um but also I'm I'm saying that in the context of like you know it's like just uh, like soaking it all in and I don't know how that's possible like at this time like you know and, you know, I, I think, you know, you guys are on campus and like, how do you do it? And like, how do you soak it all in? But part of that was like, I mean, we partied hard, like party very, 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 very hard. Um, and I think the legacy of like our partying hard has like made very stringent rules on the campus of Cranbrook right now as a result of like the streams that we took it to. But still, I think, partying is part of the thing like it's, it's designed but it's just like like get down like like get geeky like like I know you're like really into music and like some of the same you like you know it's like I always wanted to chop it up with you guys at like LTU about music like going to deep dive like you know and, and, and talk about stuff um 
but like relating on those levels and not just talking about like grids and like layouts and things like that, you'll get really far. Um, and then that stuff can come back into the design in really meaningful ways. And I think that's what like Elliot is trying to see, you know what I'm saying? Like you soak it in and then translate it um, and, 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 you know, ultimately be smart about the things that you do. But um, there's a lot of room to like get to know people on personal levels and, and lead with, like a lot of times I think about just like, what do you lead with? Do you lead with like the business, um, the business side of the mullet or do you, you know, lead with the party side of the mullet? You know what I mean? And like, that's where you really want to like, even if you got to back into it, back into it that way. Um, so totally. Th thanks, man. Yeah, it's just it's been it's been weird times. I mean, obviously, I think I, I know I'm super grateful to still be here. I think everybody else is. It's just it's a it's a very, uh, a very odd time for sure. <laughs>